Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, I am proud and honored to bring you an interview with Sister Megan Rice, the 85-year-old nun and peace activist who is imprisoned by our government on sabotage charges for her 2012 nonviolent peace protest at the Y-12 site in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, often referred to as this country's fourth knox for uranium. As regular listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat already know, Sister Megan is now out of prison because the sabotage charge was overturned two weeks ago. But as you will learn in today's interview, this case is far from over. You will also hear interviews with Sister Megan's co-activists, 60-year-old Gregory Borche Obed and 66-year-old Michael Wally, who provide insights on the actions they took, what actually happened on the site that fateful day, and the government's true strategy in charging three gray-haired peace activists with sabotage. You'll also learn about the legal battle they still face. Stunning information from three genuine heroes of our movement. To be able to present those interviews to you in extended length, there will be no news section this week, nor will there be a numbnuts of the week. We will return to our standard format next week, so that now we can present to you Transform Now Plowshares, the special. I don't know if it's possible to feel both proud and humbled, but I feel both at the thought of being able to bring to you the next three interviews with today's guests, the activists of Transform Now Plowshares. First, Sister Megan Rice. She is an 85-year-old anti-nuclear activist and Roman Catholic nun of the Society of the Holy Child Jesus. On July 28, 2012, at the age of 82, she, then 57-year-old Greg Borcha Obed and 63-year-old Michael Wally, broke into the Y-12 National Security Complex in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, the U.S. government's weapons facility. In a peaceful protest they called Transform Now Plowshares, the trio squeezed baby bottles of donated human blood on the outer walls of the supposedly heavily guarded, highly enriched uranium materials facility. They then spray-painted anti-war slogans, hit the walls with small hammers, put up crime scene tape, prayed, and sang. She and her co-activists were arrested, tried, and convicted not of misdemeanor trespass, the initial charge against them, but of attempting to sabotage the security of the United States. As you will hear, they should have been paid a fat consulting fee for safely exposing such a hole in U.S. nuclear weapons security, but that was not the case. For this peaceful protest action, Sister Megan received a sentence of almost three years in prison and her co-activists received sentences of over five years each. After serving more than two years just two weeks ago on May 12th, the conviction on sabotage against all three was overturned by the U.S. Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Five days later, she and the others were released. Part of the court ruling read, vague platitudes about a facility's crucial role in the national defense are not enough to convict a defendant of sabotage. Amen to that. I spoke with Sister Megan on Monday, May 25th, 2015. Sister Megan, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you so much. First of all, did you know that your case was in the process of being reviewed by the Sixth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals? And were you in any way expecting that the sabotage ruling against you was going to be taken away. I certainly knew it was happening, and I can only say common sense would say that's what would have to happen. (laughs) So, uh, you know, (laughs) 
uh, anything. We're always ready for every surprise in this country. And common sense is not necessarily the most common thing we have. So it was great news that was received by people throughout internationally, our community. When you learned of the court's decision, what was your reaction? I wasn't all that excited because I really expected that that would happen. I found out at 3 in the morning, I was listening to the BBC, and it was just a tiny little announcement at the end of a six- or seven-minute summary of the world news. And it just said in a statement that, you know, the naming us all are, are given immediate release. Let's take this back to how the action started. This has been credited or at least been mentioned in connection with something called Transform Now Plowshares. Is that a group? Is that a movement? Tell us a bit about what that is. Since about 1980, starting with Father Dan Berrigan, brother Bill Berrigan, started the Plowshares Movement which has done many, many actions, direct actions, to expose the illegality and the immorality that we all know in our hearts of of nuclear weapons. And so each of the actions, I'm not sure of the number in my head, but it's certainly more than 30, but I don't know, has a special name, just like every battleship has a special name. And... So the last one, which happened on the 2nd of November, 2009, in Kipsap, Bangor, Trident Submarine Base, was called Disarm Now. And it came to me that, okay, what's the next step? You know, part of the process, the main process of disarming is not to deplete the planet and stop, end all the jobs for people but to transform the whole thing into what we need. So the word transformation just came. So uh, the next step after disarming, on really part of it, is transform now into life-enhancing alternatives. How was the determination made that you would target the Y-12 uranium depository at Oak Ridge? Now, was the research that we were doing, mainly at that point, Greg and I, we were moving from community to community. He lived in Duluth, and so we went east. We had to go east anyway, and we stopped in Kansas City, which was the place where they were making all the non-nuclear parts to nuclear weapons, uh, for in other words, continuing the proliferation of nuclear weapons. They were willing to do something for August 2012, so we didn't need to do anything there. Then we moved on eastward and consulted with the peace movements all along the way in communities that were there. We got up to Maine even, to Bangor, I mean to um, near Portland, you know, Bath. And uh, that was another submarine carrier manufacturing place. And then we moved down, and we realized that the one that hadn't had a good direct action was Oak Ridge. We wanted to have something for 2012, August 6th and August 9th, you know, something around that time to remember 68 years ago. You, Michael, and Greg took several symbolic actions on the site. How did you determine what those actions were and what they would symbolize? It was very easy. I mean, these are the same symbols that have been used, and we've meditated on them and understood them. I started being connected with Jonah House after my mother died, and and I was there in 1999 and 2000 when a an action was going on. So I was there to reflect and pray with that community and be instructed by Phil Berrigan and Liz and the people living there. And I understood fully, and the same way with Greg, he was living there. We understood the importance of those symbols of exterminating uh, sacred life. So the sacred symbol of life certainly is blood. And to show that to the workers 
without having to say anything, was very educative and renouncing and denouncing and exposing nuclear weapons or any crime. We're all invited, humanly speaking, we must expose and oppose crimes against humanity. How supportive was your order as you were making these plans and going into this action? When I came back from Africa, I asked where I felt I could, you know, work best in this country. And I had been to the nuclear test site in Nevada 20 years before. This is 2003 and four now, really mainly 2004. And I realized that they needed somebody in Nevada. So I was allowed to do community work there and help out with that peace movement for the next six, seven years. But I was then realizing that was nuclear testing and the action at Kipsack Bangor in the state of Washington had made me see, it was two years later, that nothing really had happened. So we were ready to, to make another message. And so I asked to be able to focus just on nuclear weapons for a year. And they were very, very supportive of that. And I, I didn't have to say what I was doing. We are an order with whose charism or whose mission is to meet the wants of the age. And we have been studying what are the wants of the age since we began, encouraged by our founders, Cornelia Connolly, in 1846. So we've been constantly searching to meet the wants of the age. And I could see that this couldn't be a more important want of the age to meet, to try to meet. Let's take this into the action itself. At the point that you were dropped off and you were facing that chain link fence as you were about to go in, what were your thoughts? What were your feelings? Were you scared? Was this a profound moment? Did you pray beforehand? How did this get started? We had like an eight-day retreat before that in the area of Knoxville with the people who were very happy to be part of this designing and shaping of what would happen. And just the wonderful grace of energy uh, in our shared prayer through the eight days. And we had known from satellite, whatever, I didn't have to worry about that, exactly what and where. And so we were dropped off, not in front of the chain link fence, but before the woods, you know, we were able to mount the ridge, which is Oak Ridge, in the dark. And we just followed and we just walked through no path or anything. We just headed to the top, winding our way. And uh, obviously we were led. And then we finally, after about two hours going up, we reached in. I was, wasn't even thinking about being afraid because we were getting through and nobody was stopping us. And um, we could look down on this. It was probably 4.30, so before dawn. And we just were able to move right on down. And we were inside the three, well, first the outer fence was still in the woods. That didn't take any time. And we closed it up, you know, with little plastic ties. Very short, um, right angle, two sides of a triangle, so that we could slip through with a flap. And uh, we were all rather thin people, and it was very easy. And then we got to the top of the ridge and looked over, and then we just kept on going. We saw a bat security car just drove by. We saw it drive back, and then we just started and got to the first of the last three fences. Couldn't have been five minutes to get through one. Nothing was electrocuting us. We just moved on and got to three and we were there by quarter to five, and I had looked, the last time I looked at my watch, it was quarter to five. And we did exactly what we knew we were going to do, totally unheated, unimpeded. And uh, it took maybe ten minutes, maybe, you know, you didn't look at your clock, but not long at all. And then we had finished the three or four things we planned to do, quietly, not having any, uh, just we were all very focused. And then this way down at the opposite end of the building, which is very long, 
this van that had been driving around the roadway before drove right next to the building, uh, probably 25, 30 feet inside the last fence, I guess. I don't really remember. I mean, I couldn't measure exactly. And anyway, it drove very slowly up to us, and we were ready to meet it. And we bowing before them. It was just that one man, Kirk Garland. And we read, he was willing to listen to our, we just were ready to read to him why we were there. And that is available, and I hope people know that. We wrote that during the retreat in the eight days before. Given a link to it, I will definitely post it up on the website in connection with this episode so that people can actually read what oh, he yeah. said. The two things that we brought in were the statement, and then the second one was the indictment, a list of what laws were being infringed by continuing the manufacture, testing, use, and storage of nuclear weapons. So it sounds like rather than what has been reported that you were there for two hours before a guard showed up, that it was really a relatively short period of the time. That was ab- it's always, uh, yeah, I find that it's just a mistake. We landed on the downside of the ridge uh, probably, I think it was by 2 or 2.30. So we, we were looking at it by 4.30. Okay, so it could be like two hours to get up the hill. But the actual action itself, it sounds like it took maybe 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah, I, at certainly 20 at the outset at the most. Anybody could have done it in that little time. How did the guard respond when he suddenly came upon the three of you on this site? Yeah, well, it wasn't all that sudden. It was slow. He responded just by looking at us. We could hear him saying on the phone, his cell phone, they're peace protesters. You better send somebody along, something like that. He was very, he had known that we were peace, it was most obvious that we were peace protesters. And um, he, he had had that experience. He had been at Rocky Flats for many years and then somewhere else. And, you know, you can always tell when they're peace protesters. How were you treated by the authorities when they did show up? I felt that they were, I mean, there was this, the second person was nervous and had his gun and this and that, but it was very gently. We were handcuffed and told to sit on the ground, and which we did. You know, this is now 5.15, 5.30. took a little while for the more vans to come. And we were on the ground with our hands cuffed at the back, with our ankles cuffed from then on. You know, we watched the sun come up. People gradually, you know, like undressed, because it was Saturday morning. Those that were higher up in the line of the marshals uh, spoke very politely to us. You don't, you, if you want to answer some questions, you don't have to without your lawyer kind of thing. And then we sat there. You know, it wasn't until maybe 10 o'clock they brought three collapsible chairs, but we would stand up, you know, just because it was stiff and all that, and they had to help me get up. You know, you'd stand maybe every 20 minutes or five minutes or something like that. It took them all that time to get their act together, in other words. You were initially charged with misdemeanor trespass. And then suddenly the charges were up to damaging a defense facility under the Sabotage Act, which carries a sentence of up to 20 years in prison. And there was also the charge of causing more than $1,000 damage to government property, which carries up to 10 years in prison. Why do you think the charges against you were so dramatically increased in their severity? Obviously, they didn't want a trial. They thought we would try to get out easily with a plea bargain. Oh, was that the strategy? Uh, oh, absolutely. They always want plea bargains. Was there any question in your minds about taking a plea bargain? No or question. Along? At, no possibility of a question. And what did you hope to accomplish with the trial and the resulting disability? To doing what? We had to do. It's the obligation of every, we're all equally responsible to expose and oppose 
known crimes. So there was nothing else we could do but do it in order to make a very clear message quickly. I know you take your ministry with you wherever you go, and you ended up spending over two years in prison. What was it like for you in there, and what sort of work were you able to do or were you moved to do with the women who you met there? I would say I was more minister to than ministering. With ministry, we believe, is totally shared. It's a giving and a sharing and a receiving, and none of those can be exaggerated in order to be harmoniously accomplished. And it, it happened to me. I received as much as I shared, as much as I gave. We always say in West Africa, go by opposites when you're in the reality of the thing. Nobody could imagine what the reality is until we experience it. And I have been overawed by amazingly strong and gifted women and um, uh, some compassionate men. There were not many for me to interact with, but some were very respectful and uh, interacting that way. But, of course, we I was fellow inmates. And I also had a lot of time to interact with the world because I did try to respond in some way to everybody who has written, either by a joint letter, because people need to be honored. I mean, everybody is involved in this and equally, whether they're writing letters, whether they're sitting at home with their arthritis or whether they're just, you know, sending the energy through prayer to harmonize and heal the world. And it's just part of that grand scheme of of healing the planet of its wounds and being healed, of course. In this time between your release and the fact that you're going to still have to go back to court for resentencing sometime this summer on the one remaining charge. What are your plans for this period of time before you find out finally whether they are going to put you back in jail or whether they're just going to declare time served and let you go? I haven't had time to do any planning. My time has been taken up and programmed by something ever since we were released last Saturday evening at 6 o'clock. So I just followed the, what was the next call, for, you know, the next day, what, what had emerged. I had a remote plan. I knew that I could, you know, get a medical checkup immediately and then some recommendations in the same building to see whatever I needed, slight checkups, which were very, very minor. And everything is very mild, and I don't have anything to worry about. You know, it's just very practical things. So I'm just staying nearby and, and doing, accomplishing those things and trying to respond to telephone calls from people like you. We haven't even had a chance to talk to each other, Mike and Greg, you know, because Greg was in transit, and, and there just hasn't been time for me to dial them and nor them to dial me. Were you in contact at all during the time that you were in prison? Not really, really. We were meant to be, but Greg got his paperwork done coming from Leavenworth, but each of the places where I was just didn't respond to it. I definitely had a, we had a right to be in touch with each other, but we couldn't. They never came and told me it's okay to do it. In your mind, where would you like your action to lead. What do you want to happen now? And given that the listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat are international, we have 38 countries that listen to this show on a monthly basis, mm. what can we do to support you in where you want this to go next? I don't think that I'm seeking support for me. There's only one thing to do, and that is Anybody who is available and free and carrying on with what they're all doing to expose and oppose nuclear weapons of mass destruction. And, and I see that people have each has their own gifts of creativity, their own style of doing it, and I totally honor. I'm going to say you, and I'm speaking to all the people that you're in network with, and thank you. 
and just carry on and continue to see how we can make this message, you know, more, you know, and just react to the uh, denial of the Non-Proliferation Treaty Conference, uh, you know, the review that just ended on Friday, and let's support uh, the ray of hope there, the, the countries that are just getting out of that thing because they failed. New York Times doesn't even mention what was happening at the UN for the last month. So we all need to get in touch with the people who are involved in these international treaties and what can we do? How can we speak out? Because we are the majority. We're not the minority. Sister Megan Rice, you are one of my heroes. I am honored to be speaking with you. I support you, and if there's anything I can do to help you in the future, please do not hesitate to let me know. You're doing it, dearie. You're on it. So we, it is a mutually assured um, admiration society. Should we say that? Thank you so much for that. Sister Megan Rice, you are a hero to so many of us, and I am deeply honored that we have been able to spend this time together on Nuclear Hot Seat. Bless you, dearie, and uh, divert to the to what you're doing. You're doing a great job, and thank you. Sister Megan Rice. We'll continue with the Transform Now Plowshares special in just a moment. But first, yes, I glow in the dark. One mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond is my story of what it meant to be one mile from the leaking nuclear reactor at Three Mile Island when it happened. A story best suited for the dark of the night on Halloween, but you can read it anytime. It's now available on Amazon as a Kindle download, and you can read it on any digital device. You can find it by going to Amazon and searching for Yes, I Glow in the Dark, or by the link up on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com. And now, back to Nuclear Hot Seat's Transform Now Plowshares special. I next spoke with Greg Borcha Obed another of the three Transform Plowshares activists who took part in the Y-12 action. Greg is an Army veteran who lived at a Catholic worker house in Minnesota and was 57 years old in 2012 when the action took place. Last Monday, May 18, was his 60th birthday and second day out of prison. Did you know that the 6th U.S. Court of Appeals was going to be reviewing your case? And was there any anticipation at all that the sabotage conviction was going to be overturned and that you were going to be released at this time? Well, the lawyers had sent us the oral argument, and they had written that they were cautiously optimistic. When they had the oral argument, some of the judges asked questions hard questions of the prosecutor especially, but questions that showed they understood our issues and say that they were optimistic that we might get a favorable ruling. And then we waited like eight, nine weeks. And then the ruling came, but the lawyers were still saying it could be a couple of months because the prosecution could appeal it. And then they said, you know, we... We're putting in the motion for immediate release, but the prosecution might oppose it. They had until noon on Monday. It turned out the prosecution did not oppose it. The ruling came on Friday, which I didn't hear about, and a guard came and said, come with me on Saturday afternoon. That was a big surprise. So you didn't know that you were about to be released when you were about to be released? No. I didn't get any indication. They stopped me from getting my emails. They, they do that sometimes. They prevent you from getting your outside information. Was there any reason for that that they gave, or they don't have to No, justify? no, I, I, I never spoke to them about it, but that, that just seems to be their pattern. A friend of mine got an email saying that I had gotten immediate release, but I didn't really believe it because... I wasn't released, and nobody was telling me anything. They didn't block his email, but they, they blocked my email. While you were imprisoned, 
were you able to be in touch with Sister Megan and Michael Wally? According to the law, we should have been able to, but the prison authorities always said they're working on it. They're, they're working on getting permission. And so after 14 months, I didn't have a lot of faith in what they were saying. They never gave permission for us to communicate. Even though the law says if you're on appeal and you're co-defendants, you should be allowed to communicate. Going back into the action that started everything, when and how did you and Sister Rice and Michael Walney come together, and how did it evolve that you did this Transform Now Plowshare action? Well, Megan was the um, initial spur. She uh, had attended the trial for the Disarm Now Plowshares, and she felt very moved by the expert witnesses and the testimony of the defendants, and she felt she should do such a thing. And she ended up calling me, and then we collaborated for a while. We discerned, we prayed, and then we kind of like contacted other people, and Michael was interested. He just heard about it, and he contacted us. And how did the three of you know each other? Was there prior connection? Were you part of some community together? Oh, yes. Megan and I lived together in community in Baltimore, maybe for a year. And Michael lived in a nearby community in Washington, D.C. And I've known Michael for, like, 20 years, maybe. And we did a plowshares action together before this one. There were certain actions that you decided to take before going there, which included the spraying of the outside of the building with baby bottles of donated blood, spray painting F.A. War graffiti, singing, praying, putting up banners. Why were these specific actions chosen, and how were they chosen? Well, there is a long history of plowshares actions in the U.S., and some in other countries in which hammers and human blood have been used as symbols. And we felt we wanted to join that tradition of peacemakers, and so we brought small hammers. We didn't hammer on weapon parts like other plowshares actions. We hammered on the wall. That's a symbol of fulfilling the, a prophecy in Isaiah that in the latter days people will learn God's ways and beat their swords into plowshares. And that's where the hammer comes in. So we hammered a little bit on the wall in a symbolic act, and it symbolized our hope of the crumbling of the nuclear weapon infrastructure. And the blood, we poured the blood on the walls as a symbol of what the weapons actually have been doing when we make them, because many people die from just the uranium mining and the producing of the weapons and then the testing of the weapons. Rosalie Bertel estimated that 10 million people have died just from the making of the weapons. And so it was a symbolic act to say we are against this killing, this potential mass murder of the planet, and we're willing to give our blood to prevent more bloodshed. Within the movement, as I have been coming into and experiencing it, there seems to be a separation in people's thinking between mining and weapons and reactors. Do you agree with this separation or not, and what would your reasons be? When I was in the prison, I read a book by Robert Gleason. Forget the title, but it had to do with nuclear power and nuclear weapons. And he makes the point, and quotes other people, that when you make a nuclear power plant, the waste material from that is fuel for our nuclear weapon. You, you can alter that, you know, enrich it, not too difficultly, and make a weapon. And so what he says is, if you're against nuclear weapons, you really need to be against nuclear power also. And that... When we, as a nation, promoted nuclear power all around the planet in all these other countries, those are precursors of potential nuclear weapons. 
going back to the actual action that you took, what did you do to prepare for it, and what did it take to get you to the point that you were actually in front of that first chain link fence? Well, we spent many, many um, weeks in prayer and discernment and study. We uh, studied that the issues regarding the three nuclear weapons plants that have been proposed by Obama, and then Congress had given the money for them. And so we knew from studying the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty that this trend of modernizing our weapons, nuclear weapons, is illegal. From our viewpoint, from the Nuremberg Treaties, if you are aware of your government committing a war crime, you have a right and a duty to take steps to intervene in that war crime. And we understood that the building of this next weapon factory, they call it the uranium processing facility, that would be a further war crime. And so we, we studied, we collaborated, we went on retreat. Megan and I went on a retreat about Gandhi, and so we looked at the spiritual roots of protesting and how if you take on suffering yourself, that is a way to bring about social change. That was a, a fundamental teaching of Gandhi. And so Plowshares' actions are part of that history. And then Michael met up with us, and we continued to pray and study and look at our symbols. We wrote up two statements. One was an indictment of the government war crimes, and one was our group statement communicating the values and our, our purpose for doing the action. When you actually began to take the action, were you frightened? Were you exhilarated? Was there any point when you were doing this where you felt like second-guessing yourself? There is a lot of trepidation and uncertainty when you're preparing to go into an area that we knew was called the lethal force zone. We wanted to go all the way up to the building, and we knew there were these high security fences. But we also knew from our faith and from other plowshares actions that, surprisingly, the spirit does lead people to complete and to do the hammering and the pouring of blood. And so... We were very hopeful also. Now, during the action, when we approached that inner fences that said lethal force zone, and we knew there was some kind of technology for motion detectors and maybe microwaves, they even said in advance there's other technology that they weren't publicly saying. So when, we, when I approached that with Megan and Michael, uh, the thought did come to me, we're not going to make it. Uh, this is just too advanced, too difficult, and we should turn around. But then like a split second later, the inner voice said, well, you came this far, you should, you should keep trying. So uh, we cut through that fence. No sensors went off. No alarms were ringing. There was no spotlight. And we just proceeded calmly, and we cut through the next fence, and we were able to do everything we had hoped to be able to do. How long were you actually at the site before the guard showed up, and what were you doing when he did appear? Well, it is a big facility, and there's a long ways over the woods and all. So we, we cut through the first fence, and then it was maybe an hour or more, but there's not sensors by the first fence. There's not even barbed wire. But once we cut through those last three fences, it might have been 10 or 15 minutes when we get through the last fence to when the guard came. And then we had poured the blood. We had spray painted. We had put up the, this is a crime scene tape, and we had put out the other symbols of the bread and our leaflets and the books that we brought. Michael was still spray painting at the time, but Megan and I had finished all the, the work that we had done. So it did feel like a very complete action when the guard arrived. 
How did the guard respond to you, and did you feel in any way in danger when he did find you? The first guard was very professional, we felt. He was calm. He was rational. He spoke to us. We spoke to him. He understood we were protesters. We said we were here. We were led by God. We gave him our statement. We read our statement to him. We sang songs. Uh, This little light of mine is one that I recall. And he was not a threat. He was not uh, hurtful or harmful to us. Were there other guards who came to back him up, and did the situation change then? Yes. The second guard, I believe, was his supervisor, and he was very belligerent, and he gave the order to put on the handcuffs very tight and then refused to loosen them. And that caused a great deal of pain, especially to Michael and I. Michael's wrists were bleeding by the time we were brought to the the county jail, and one of my wrists was completely numb, like for a month later, because he really abused his authority, I believe. Now, the three of you were initially charged with misdemeanor trespass and destruction and depredation of government property, all of which are misdemeanors, but then the charges were changed to damaging a defense facility under the Sabotage Act, which carried a sentence of up to 20 years in prison. Why do you think the government made the change in the severity of the charges against you? Well, uh, technically, I think first we were charged with trespass. That was a misdemeanor. Then we were charged with malicious destruction. That was a five-year charge. I think that's a felony. Then we were charged with destruction of government property, which is a 10-year felony. And then, you know, after some time, they offered us a plea bargain. They said, plead guilty to the 10-year charge, destruction of government property, and we will not bring further charges. And they said, if you don't plead guilty to the 10-year charge, we will bring three or four more serious felonies and give you life in prison. And they were talking like homeland security charges and the sabotage charge. And our lawyers conveyed this to us, and we said to our lawyers that we are not guilty, the government is committing war crimes, and so we will not plead guilty to any offense. And therefore, they brought the sabotage charge. How was it going through the trial? These trials are very difficult because the government introduces motions to prevent your testimony, to prevent our expert witnesses. We had Ramsey Clark testify at a pre-trial hearing that what we did was legal, that what the government is doing at that factory is unlawful. They are committing a war crime. And all that testimony that Ramsey gave before the judge was ruled inadmissible, and we were prevented from saying those things during our trial also. It's called a motion in limine. It's really a gag order on the defendants to speak freely about our motivation and what we understand the laws to be. And so it's, it's really very difficult to go through such a trial. It sounds like the government was afraid of the three of you and what you had to say and reveal in the course of the trial. That is one way to put it, and the reason is, in previous plowshares trials, in the U.S. and in other countries, when the defendants can speak about their motivation, when they can speak about the Nuremberg Principles, juries have failed to convict, and that is the concern of the government. There's even been... um, trials in other countries where plowshares activists have been found not guilty several times by juries. Now that you have been released, and there's going to be a resentencing coming up this summer on the remaining charge, but it is generally believed by your attorneys and by those of us within the movement that you're going to be released with time served for the time you've already been in prison. What are your plans between now and the resentencing, 
And what are your plans afterwards should you be given your complete freedom? Well, I think we should back up one more step. Okay. Our attorneys have said that the process of appeal is not over with. The government has until June 22nd to appeal the circuit court ruling in our favor. They can ask for a 15-judge panel to reverse it. And some of the attorneys say it's likely that the government will appeal it, but then it's uncertain what the full panel will do. We're hoping that they would agree with the two-to-one decision. But that's still up in the air. So we're not, like, ready for resentencing yet. It could be quite some time if the government appeals and the circuit court wants to review it again. Moving forward, is there any plan for the three of you to write a book or have a book written about this or in some other way continue this message whether you do continue in prison or not? Maybe you haven't heard, but there are two books underway right now by our professional writers. One is by Eric Schlosser, who wrote an article for The New Yorker about our action and about Plowshares action. He is expanding that article and making some corrections and hopes to have it published by August 6th, the last time I heard. Uh, he was going to call it Gods of Metal. Maybe that will get delayed because of the appeal, but that was the last word I had from him. And then Dan Zach, the Washington Post reporter, is working on a much longer and much more detailed book about our, this particular action. If you would have any lasting impact from this dramatic action, this self-sacrificing action that the three of you have taken, what would that be? Well, we hope that um, all around the world people will begin to stand up and speak out and oppose this modernization of the nuclear weapon and the continued proliferation to other countries and that this will be a sign for peace activists and you know, for ordinary people that the forces of violence do not always win. There is a stronger force with nonviolent and with taking nonviolent action, which can break through sometimes, and we hope, like, be a beacon to give encouragement to people. And if there's anything that the international listenership of Nuclear Hot Seat can do to support you moving forward, what would you ask of us? All around the world, people can take actions where they are. They, they can, well, they, many people around the world did write to us and encourage us. But my understanding is with this nonproliferation conference that just occurred, there is a movement to try to, like, have a gra grassroots swelling against nuclear weapons. And many, like, non-nuclear power states are taking the lead in this. They are saying the nuclear weapon states must disarm. We, we signed the treaty. Other people signed treaties saying that they wouldn't develop weapons if the nuclear power states disarmed. And so we encourage everyone to be a part of that movement to speak out, to act out, to say now is the time to stop building the weapons and to, to get rid of them. That's the ICANN program, and we have covered that on Nuclear Hot Seat as well. Greg, is there anything left that you would like to say that we haven't had a chance to cover? Well, I'm just very, I'd like to express great gratitude for all the people who are working against nuclear weapons, Many, you know, thousands of people wrote to us with their support. 16,000, I think, signed a petition or sent cards and letters to the judge. And I'd also like to thank our attorneys for all their great and intense work on our, our behalf. And thank you for your role in this also of communicating the need for disarmament. That was Transform, now Plowshares Activist. Greg Borcha Obed.
the third peace activist who took part in the action and was also sentenced to over five years in jail, is 66-year-old Michael Wally. Michael is a two-tour Vietnam veteran who lived at the Dorothy Day Catholic Worker House in Washington, D.C. until his arrest. I interviewed Michael, but unfortunately, technical difficulties rendered the vast majority of our talk unusable. I was, however, able to savage a brief portion of his comments on the planning for and execution of the Y-12 protest. Here it is. It was the product of, of prayer. It was the product of discernment. A lot of the, the choices that we made communally, we all agreed on all the basics of the action. We prayerfully prepared the action for months in advance. We were all people of faith. The global demilitarization is a realistic goal and worthy goal for all of us to yearn for and aspire for and labor for. A lot of the things that we did in the course of this particular Plowshear action had been done in previous plowshears action. Blood borings have been done uh, in many of the plowshears actions. Basically, all of our plans, the essential um, elements of our plans were uh, all accomplished. We got to the very building that we had planned on getting to. We, we poured the blood we did, intended on pouring. We had the uh, crime scene tape uh, put where we wanted it. We uh, had time to accomplish the, the, the missionary uh, effort that we had uh, mutually agreed upon to uh, accomplish when we got to the building. We all, all three of us regarded it as a, a miracle. Transform Now Plowshares activist Michael Wally. The statement and indictment referred to in these interviews and drawn up by these three brave activists were read at the Y-12 site and are available on their website, transformplowshares.wordpress.com slash about. To make it simple, I'll have a link up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com. I urge you to read and share both documents. This is what Nuclear Hot Seat does. Brings you the anti-nuclear news that either you won't get anywhere else or you're going to have to piece together from a lot of different sources. So if what you hear on the show makes you laugh, think, helps you understand the nuclear issues, and not be so alone with your awareness, help us keep it going. Donations are the only way we get to meet the bills, so if you would care to help out, please go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the home page, and click on the big red Donate button. My gratitude to those of you who do donate, some of you a small amount on a monthly basis, and know that whatever is offered is considered energy and support and help, and I am grateful to all of you. Activist shout-out, the Garifuna Film Festival, now in its fourth year here in Los Angeles, presents films about indigenous people's issues. Last Sunday, it screened Nuclear Savage, Adam Horowitz's powerful film about the Marshall Islanders, which won the 2014 Yellow Oscar at the Uranium Film Festival. Nuclear Savage covers the atomic bomb testing in the South Pacific after World War II, from the perspective of the Marshall Islanders, who were thrown off their ancestral lands and used by the United States as guinea pigs in a multi-generational study of the impact of nuclear radiation on human beings. An unforgettable, wicked good film. I was honored to be invited to lead the post-film discussion, where I shared the podium with Marianne Williamson, if you're not familiar with Marianne, she is an American spiritual leader, author, and lecturer, best known as the author of the poem that starts, Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Yes, that was her. Gratitude to the head of the Garifuna Film Festival, Frida Sideroff, for exposing a new population of filmgoers to the truth about nuclear evils. Here's today's final thought. Interviewing Sister Megan Rice this week, I remembered something that I thought about back in the earliest post-Fukushima days. Now, before I start, full disclosure. I do not consider myself a Christian. 
I was born Jewish, and I figure that any religion that was good enough for Jesus is good enough for me. So I do not believe in a literal devil. However, if one considers the concept of the devil, what images come up? Hellfire, eternal damnation, misery without end. And I've often thought that it is a perfect description of nuclear. Hellfire? Consider the blast of an atomic bomb or the hot, unholy hell of a nuclear reactor's chain reaction. Eternal damnation? What else can we call the radiation caused damage to DNA that taints our genetic downline and condemns future generations, should they even be able to be born, to birth defects, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, weakened immune systems, and all the other radiation-induced ills that shorten lifespans, create illness and misery, and can never, ever, ever, to the best of our current knowledge, be reversed. I'm not talking religion here. I'm using devil as a metaphor for all things nuclear, and I think it is a damned good one. So I've started sharing this concept with some of the good Christian women I know. Some of them resist. Some are intrigued. Some get it. Some don't. Yet. But in light of what Sister Megan said about all of us needing to do what we can, when we can, to spread information in our fight against nuclear, this is certainly a topic of discussion some of you might want to take up. Meanwhile, I'll let you know how it's going for me, because, you know, when it comes to nuclear, we are all in for a devil of a time. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, May 26, 2015. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com and iTunes under podcasts. Our archive is available on the website, nuclearhotseat.com. Search for a topic and you'll find the right episode. Or you can go to iTunes. We also have a YouTube channel, Nuclear Hot Seat Videos. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed, as long as proper attribution is provided. We'll be going out on a different piece of music in honor of the Transform Now Plowshares activists. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that on Democracy Now!, when Amy Goodman asked Sister Megan Rice how it felt to be free, Sister Megan said, as long as there is one nuclear bomb left in the world, none of us is free. So we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Shine, let it shine, let it shine.